Parables of the Messiah by Brother John Carter Parables of the Messiah number 76 The Rich Man and Lazarus Luke 16 verses 19 to 31 the parable of the rich man and Lazarus is usually discussed as a contribution to the teaching of Scripture on the death state. That Jesus used a common belief as the basis for his parable is generally accepted, but there is no reason for thinking that the use of such a belief in this way committed Jesus to endorsing it. The teaching of the parable in relation to the death state is considered in the Christadelphian shield. We concern ourselves here with the lesson that Jesus intended to convey by the story. There is an easily traced sequence in the context. In chapter 15, verses 1 to 2, Luke says that the publicans and sinners drew around Jesus to hear him. This led to the murmuring of the scribes and Pharisees who said, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Jesus therefore addressed to the murmurers the three parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal. The last of these left the elder son outside the house, angry and churlishly refusing to go in. That was the position of the Pharisees and scribes. Turning to the disciples, Jesus told them the parable of the unjust steward, drawing the lesson of the faithful use of riches, warning them that it was impossible to serve God and mammon, and pointing to a still greater stewardship in which faithfulness was equally necessary. The parable of the steward and the comments of Jesus stung the Pharisees. They were lovers of money, says Luke. And since a man cannot love money and love God, as Jesus had just said, they could not be lovers of God. Instead of receiving the admonition of Jesus, they hardened their hearts and derided him. Jesus replied, Ye are they which justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. This tore away their rags of self-righteousness. They performed their prayers and their alms that men might see them. They sought the esteem of men and received a receipt in full, as Jesus many times told them. There was nothing owing to them from God for anything they had done. But God was not indifferent. He did not esteem them, but regarded them as an abomination. Jesus adds three sayings, the connection of which is not at first obvious, but which is traced out more fully in the consideration of the parable of the unjust steward. Really, these sayings are an indictment of unfaithfulness on the part of those scribes and Pharisees. The law and the prophets were until John. They had not kept the law. Since John the kingdom was preached, but they did not seek to enter, verse 16. Yet not the least detail of God's law would fail, verse 17. In one respect, perhaps particularly so as rich men, they flagrantly set aside the law by the rules which had made divorce easy and common, verse 18. Against this background of tense feeling of the rulers, and plain speaking on the part of Jesus, he adds the parable. There was a rich man, obviously the rich, money-loving rulers. How were they using their wealth? 
the unjust steward had shown wisdom even in his use of it, but the rich man did nothing but gratify his own desires. Opportunity was at his gate, but he ignored it. The poor and sick Lazarus would have welcomed even the crumbs from his table. Then the scene changes to the future, and the positions of Dives and Lazarus are reversed. Too late, the rich man was ready to recognize Lazarus, but now it is he who seeks the ministrations. Too late also the request that warning be given to others. There were the law and the prophets, the divine testimony, and nothing could add to, to their authority, though one rose from the dead. If the opportunities provided by the knowledge of the law were neglected, there could be no purpose served by further revelation. By a divine coincidence, the request of the rich man in the parable was granted in the resurrection of another Lazarus, and the words of Jesus proved only too true. Instead of repenting, they sought more determinedly to get Jesus put to death. John 11, verse 47 to 57. Primarily, the parable shows that the Pharisees had lives centered in the present. Observe Abraham's answer, Thy good things. The possessiveness of present things and the blindness to any future good is clearly indicated. They might gain the world, but their lives were forfeit. The future was not theirs. The despised outcasts pressing into the kingdom in response to the teaching of Jesus would inherit the Abrahamic blessing. We cannot miss a further application from a national point of view. Israel was rich as a nation. They had advantages much every way, as Paul said. But the wealth was not for themselves. They were appointed a priestly kingdom, and they should have let the light of God's law and revelation shine to others. They were advantageously placed for so doing. They were not pushed away in some obscure corner, hidden under bed or bushel, but set on the candlestick of the hills of Palestine, where all could see them and learn from them. Solomon had this aspect of their work in mind when he prayed that the stranger, coming from a far country for thy name's sake, should be heard that all peoples of the earth may know thy name, to fear thee, as doth thy people Israel. The first of Kings, chapter 8, verses 41 to 43. But Israel became self-centered and proud, and despised the Gentiles at their gates. But a change came. The Jewish nation was cast off, and has been through the fires of persecution, while the stranger at the gate has been introduced into the covenants of promise and has rejoiced in the hope of Israel. When the change of heart is given to Israel, not included in the parable as it does not come within its purpose, they will recognize that Moses and the prophets testified that their Redeemer would be raised from the dead, and they will then find that Jesus of Nazareth is he. Meanwhile, continuing in unbelief, there is no respite from the torment and the suffering the nation undergoes. Whilst possessing Moses and the prophets, the veil is on their hearts when those scriptures are read, as Paul declared in the second of Corinthians chapter 3, but when they turn to the Lord, the veil will be taken away. Parables of the Messiah, number 77. Unprofitable Servants. Luke 17, verse 7 to 10. To understand many of the sayings of Jesus, 
It is necessary to remember the social customs and the conditions of life in his day. The servant of this parable must not be thought of as a modern farm labourer, but as a bond slave of the first century. Applying the arrangements so general today of fixed hours and pay to the situation of the parable puts the employer therein described in an unfavourable light. The parable is a transcript from life in Christ's day. Jesus said, but which of you, having a servant ploughing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, By and by, when he is come from the field, Go and sit down to meet, and will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. By and by, like most words and phrases in the English tongue, which once described immediateness, has lost its note of urgency. One signifying immediately, it now denotes after an interval. Restore the idea that the servant coming from the field is, without any break, told to prepare the master's meal, and we realise how completely the time and energy of a bond slave was at his master's disposal. When the man had done all required, he had only done his duty. He had given no overtime labour, no extra service to which the master was not entitled. The aim of the parable concerns the servant's duty. To see in the master a picture of an exactor, and then to find in him a representation of God, is to read into the parable something not intended, and to create needless difficulty. So likewise ye. In these words Jesus faces the lesson. The theme of the parable is a bond slave's labour. This application is also indicated by the opening word, but, which relates the parable to the preceding discourse, which concerned the duty of disciples. The connection of the parable with the conversation of Jesus which it follows appears to be this. Jesus had spoken of the grave responsibility of men who put stumbling blocks in the way of their brethren, verses 1 and 2. He then points out the duty towards an offender that devolves upon the one offended. Since he knows, and possibly he alone, of the trespass, it is his duty to seek his brother's recovery by showing him his sin. If this brings forth repentance, forgiveness must follow. The Lord lays down a hard task. It is so much easier for human nature to bear malice and to nurse a grievance than to seek for peace in Christ's way. Christ's Lord is good for both the offended and offender. An offence grows bigger as it feeds on injured pride. To seek out a brother and tell him his fault with a view to their rectification calls for a sober constraint which prevents exaggeration on the one hand, and which fosters an understanding spirit on the other. The disciples felt the difficulty of the instruction and said, Lord, increase our faith. Jesus in answer spoke of the faith as a grain of mustard seed, by which a tree could be moved from one place to another. Then comes the parable of the servant, commencing with, but Jesus had enjoined a difficult task. He had told them it was possible by faith. The parable declared the task to be a duty of the bond slave of God. The service in the parable is truly exacting. A day's toil in the field extended to service in the house 
when rest would not only be welcome, but might be reasonably expected. But the demands of the service of Christ are exacting too. They extend beyond the day to the evening hours. In his service, fixed hours of work are unknown, and the simple duty of each servant is to perform willingly and efficiently all duties at all times. Jesus never minimizes the task of discipleship. His sayings in many ways illustrated his own attitude to life and that which he called for in those who would follow him. Seeking the kingdom first, hating father and mother, taking up the cross, letting the dead bury their dead, never looking back when the hand has been put to plough. All these sayings illustrate the fullness of his demands. In making these calls for effort, for undivided loyalty, for lifelong service, for all powers to be used in the discharge of discipleship, Jesus shows himself to be a great leader. We have in recent years all observed the power of the call to heroic service when forcefully, fearlessly, and unsparingly expressed. When the wartime Prime Minister of England took office, he called on his countrymen to a supreme service. He offered only blood, toil, tears, and sweat, and the nation responded to a severe demand made without any hiding of its rigours, when honeyed words would have failed. The same high quality of leadership in a great crisis was exhibited when at Dunkirk the nation only saved its army by a tremendous effort, and then at the loss of all equipment. Then the call was made, and the challenge uttered, We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And even if, which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part of it were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until, in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. This graphic and vigorous language demanded the united efforts in which the last ounce of reserve would be called up to win. On another occasion he said, This is no time for ease and comfort. It is the time to dare and endure. If we can understand a human call which exacts a full response, which demands all, we may then understand the meaning of Jesus when, in relation to higher things, he tells us that the toil of the day may be followed by further duty at night, and that even then all is only what the service requires. When all is done, there is no profit to the owner, no excess has been given beyond what is due. The parable depicts the required spirit of the Lord's bond slaves. All who are bought by his death are his slaves. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 21 to 23. Paul felt the designation of bond-slave of Christ an honour as well as a mark of duty to be done. And Paul uses the figure of others who also have become servants of righteousness. Romans 6, verse 16 to 22. The parable is a corrective to pride as well as a call to work. It calls for the recognition that in a real sense there is nothing we can give to God, 
and therefore all idea of merit is excluded. From this point of view, the parable served to show to the disciples that the Pharisaic hope of creating a title to God's favour by personal merit was vain. A strange use has been given to the parable by Roman Catholic interpreters. By division of duties into grades, some for the common man and higher duties for the fuller consecrate, the teaching of the parable was classed as a counsel of perfection for the observance of those devoted wholly to the religious life. Certain positive commandments were for all, but the demands for a fuller renunciation concerned the perfect, who practised celibacy, renounced property and enter monastic life. Such a division was designed to make Christianity easy for the multitude, while the extra service was given to the voluntary poverty and celibacy of the monastic orders. Such a view is far removed from the teaching of Christ. Jesus recognised no such grades of holiness. Before all his followers he put the one high standard, Be ye perfect! as your Father in heaven is perfect. The whole emphasis of this parable is put on the servant's duty. The use of such an emphasis is at times an essential part of a teacher's work, but a wise teacher also finds a place at the right time for other aspects of the relationship of master and servant. This Jesus did in the parable of the Master who serves, Luke 12, verse 35 to 38, which should be read in conjunction with the one considered in this section.